This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts, making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's breakthrough adaptive resistance technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. BioFit founder John Zarbock says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. And number three, learn how ARX can help you grow your strength training business. Go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence. Lauren Snell here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com and the podcast where we discuss high intensity strength training and provide you with the tools, the tactics and strategies to help you grow your strength training business. This is episode 343. And in this episode, I'm catching up with John Little. We're going to be talking about exercise, business and his latest hit uni course. Today's guest is John Little, who returns to the podcast after multiple appearances John is considered one of the top fitness researchers in North America by Ironman magazine. He's an accomplished author in the field of exercise, titles including Max Contraction Training, The Art of Expressing the Human Body, The Time Savers Workout, and of course, Body by Science. John is also an accomplished writer in philosophy, history, and martial arts. His articles have been published in every major fitness and martial arts magazine in North America, and he's produced over 40, I'm sure much more than that now, publications. John, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much, Laura. It's always good to speak with you. (laughs) Likewise. Thank you for taking the time. And as I was saying to you before we started recording, one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about is your strength training business. As you know, we have a lot of people tune into this business as per the name, High Intensity Business, to learn how they can start and grow their, their strength training business. And you've got a really interesting outlook on business and perspective on your own. So can you tell us how you got started with that business? Um, Yeah. I mean, it started completely by accident. Most things in my life were by happenstance, not by planning. Um, I it was when I was really interested in max contraction training, which for the uh, viewer or listener who is unfamiliar with that, it was a protocol I was researching, which involved taking each individual muscle group into a position of full contraction and applying a resistance to it. And I found that um, most free weight exercises did not allow for this. Um, So I needed a machine and more specifically, I needed one that, um, or a brand that provided resistance in the fully contracted position when you isolated a muscle and that was in sync with the strength curve of the muscle. So immediately Nautilus, Um, And the older Nautilus machines came to the fore. So anyway, you know, I wanted Nautilus machines and I wanted to do this protocol. So I started, you know, scanning anywhere that had machines for sale. And very quickly, I had over 60 of them, which was way too much for my garage. So (laughs) some went into a neighbor's garage, some were in my garage, some went into storage. And they remained there for a while and until it, you know, obviously dawned on me that this is a complete waste. Why do you, A, why do you have these many machines? Uh, And B, what good are they doing you in a storage uh, locker? So I thought, well, I'll look into uh, maybe renting a space. You know, we're a small town and it shouldn't be too expensive to get a, you know, big square footage, throw these machines in and it'll look fabulous. And, um, so I looked around and found out that square footage was expensive, uh, too expensive to you know have a hobby and throw some machines in a facility. So I thought, well, again, given that we live in a small area, I think our population year round is about 16,000. Um, there might be enough people that are interested in training 
on good equipment, you know, which they haven't had the opportunity to. So they could come in, I could charge a nominal fee to cover off the uh, square footage rental and uh, everyone's happy. So um, that's what I did. And, you know, I had all these machines and I also had some of the old life circuit machines, which were uh, you know, some sort of rumbling, a chair is being rumbling <laughs> upstairs. Uh, apologies. But I uh, also had these old life circuit computerized machines, which provided a 40% heavier negative. And so I had like 72 machines and people would come in because this was, you know, a novelty. It was a new business in town and want to know how to use the equipment. So, uh, you know, I'd set their seat and select a weight and explain to them the principles that I was uh, advocating. And I, my thought was that they would then come in on their own, get their workout chart, check the seat position. And I'd, you know, take a page out of the old Nautilus uh, training centers in the 80s, which was one set, eight to 12, you know, eight to 10 machines. Uh, when you can do 12 reps, increase the weight and that they would be on their own. Well, it didn't work out that way. You know, they, they wanted to be put through a workout. So it was like, uh, okay, but then you'd get people who wanted the same time slot. You know, I want to come in at nine o'clock and I want you to train me. I was like, well, I, you know, I can't be in two places at once. So then we started to hire staff and, you know, the staff was trained and then they would take uh, certain clients that were doubles at certain times. And um, it was chaotic, to be honest. Um, and then once I learned that there, <laughs> there were actually people training people in a high intensity fashion, one-on-one, -on -one, things got a lot simpler because now I had a template, you know, and uh, I recognized that most people came to the facility because, because um, some guy who wrote some books on exercise ran it and that's the guy they wanted, you know? So immediately I didn't need all the staff, but what I did need was a more effective model um, for training people so that I, I didn't have uh, problems like doubles and people meandering through the gym. So uh, and after I did the book with Doug, um, actually a little before that, I'd spoken to him quite a bit and he said, you don't need all of that equipment. And I, and I didn't, I had doubles of many machines, a game with the original concept that people just come in. And if the pec deck was being used by somebody, well, that's okay. We got another one over here. So they could, it would be looked after. But since it was now a one-on-one -on -one training center, I didn't have, you know, people lining up for equipment. They, they came in for an appointment, they did their workout and, and they went home. So, it evolved. And then eventually I recognized I didn't need to be paying for the space that I was in because it was just housing equipment that wasn't being used for the most part. So then we began a process of um, discarding that which wasn't being used until I ended up with hmm, maybe 12 machines that got pretty regular use. And then being a, a Nautilus uh, aficionado, there were still some machines I liked just for the historical sake double chest machine, for example, behind the neck, torso wire. I would still love to get a compound leg machine, but that's mainly for my own interest. You know, and people, I mean, my clients would use it, but uh, it would be mainly to satisfy my passion for old Nautilus equipment. So many questions on what you just said. Um, what a, first question is, uh, how did so you, you were the guy who was writing fitness books you said there and that's and people wanted to be trained by the guy or trained in the business that the guy who writes fitness books runs but how yeah. did they i mean it, you'd still have to be into that to be aware of you i would think so how did people i guess where i'm going with this is how you've got your first like 10 20 customers because i'm trying to understand better how people really heard about you and found yeah. out about you we yeah. uh we got our first 20 customers before we even opened the doors. It was just, you know, local word of mouth buzzing in the community. Oh, new fitness center. And, you know, they're the, the contractors were still working on things like the plumbing and the bathrooms and someone would meander in and ask questions. And, you know, I, I was available to speak to them for as long as they wanted. So, you know, I told them how our approach was different than what existed in the town up until that point, uh, why our approach was different. And I've always found that if you can explain the whys and the wherefores, you will get a client usually. Um, 
it, it, I didn't like we advertised too. Once we opened, we were in the newspaper and we did radio. But uh, and, and that wasn't bad as long as you had what they call an advertorial, which is where you could control the content. And that allowed you to tell the story again, the whys and the wherefores. Um, I think with high intensity training, it's a, it's a very rational, common sense approach to exercise. And it, that resonates with people. As opposed to just saying, well, you got to come in four or five days a week and you got to do this for that and that for this. Um, you know, almost every other fitness center speaks that kind of jargon. And consequently, it's just white noise to most people. But we have principles that we espouse. We have reasons under, under um, uh, what was I going to say, or supporting those principles. Um, and, and usually we had an answer for any question they had. And, and it was a rational answer. And in some cases, a science-based answer where you could just say, well, here's the, the literature, go check it out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. And um, that was enough. And then they would speak. And then occasionally I would be asked to come and speak to a, a rotary group or somewhere where you'd have an audience and you had half an hour to 40 minutes to tell your story of a better way to exercise. And I found that that was always way more effective than, you know, the typical business thing where you just, you bullet the points, you know, you get stronger, you get, you know, lose fat and you know, live, live longer, whatever the, you know, the pitch du jour happens to be because everybody says that, you know, so that doesn't make you very uh, unique, but if you can explain, you know, why you only need once a week, for example, or why only, you know, one set uh, an exercise, um, then you've got people's attention because in, at some level, everybody seems to intuitively understand that nobody really needs to be in a gym seven days a week. You know, no one wants to be in a gym seven days a week. So if you can give them a reason why they don't have to be, and it's a valid reason, you've got their interest and, and you've given them moreover a talking point that they can share with friends and pique their interest. And I think that's what happened. Um, it's funny, we when we first opened, especially some of our defining elements, once a week, very brief workouts, um, some people viewed that as a liability. How can you sell that? You know, why would people pay for something so minuscule? Um, but I found it to be our biggest selling point. People don't want to be in a gym. Um, and one of our biggest selling points is once a week, which surprised me. Um, and initially we got some pushback, um, from people because, you know, everywhere they went from the internet to the magazines, uh, was indicating this lifestyle that you had to adopt, you know, seven days a week. And you had to buy the cowhide lifting gloves and the weight belt and the, you know, special running shoes and the gym outfits. And, and, uh, we didn't have any of that. We didn't sell supplements, you know, and every gym has supplements because it's a, it's a second revenue stream. And we've never had that. We just sell. It's training. normally a terrible revenue stream, though. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, I wouldn't know. We've never sold it, yeah. but I mean, it obviously must work for some facilities because they're still still selling it, right? Um, but I mean, the thing is, if you're selling pixie dust and magic beans, um, then I think everything else that comes out of your mouth is suspect, right? And and so we prided ourselves on being uh, evidence based. We didn't have evidence for it we weren't interested and that seemed that. so that, that was our i mean you know again i wish i could tell you i had this brilliant you know vision when i was 12 years old and i worked every day toward it now i've realized that it was it was just fortuitous accident you know that uh, uh that the gym is still around 17 years later <laughs> I don't know in a strange kind of way i like that about you and it doesn't it doesn't mean we still can't learn from you know, your experience. You can, but I, I find every, every situation requires its own adaptation. You know, yeah. um, I'm sure running a gym in Ireland is different than running it in Bracebridge, Ontario. You know, it's uh, everything is different. The attitudes of the people may be different and you have to transmit on their frequency for them to understand your message. Um, and if you, you know, if you come across at least here in the small, uh, town that I live in, uh, as 
some Hollywood personal trainer, uh, you're going to turn off so many people that you'll be closed, you know, before you pay your first hydro bill. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I actually get questions from people who you know, might email me saying, this is the demographic I'm working with, you know, my, my town or city is this small. And, and I think you probably looking at the size of, of it's base bridge, isn't it? Um, Bracebridge, yeah, yeah. Bracebridge, yes. Uh, yeah. 16,000. That probably gives um, quite a lot of, um, uh, uh, startups and people thinking about starting strength training studios a fair bit of confidence because I know people that are that were concerned about a similar size town like that in terms of opening one of these businesses. Um, just a couple of questions and observations on what you just said. So it sounds like visibility was helpful, right? The fact that you were building this facility, well, not, not visibility, really. but accessibility, like people could see it, they could come in. We're, they could we're off questions. the beaten path. We're, okay. you, know, you know the old adage about location, location, location. That didn't apply uh-huh. to it. We, I, I went for where the cheapest uh, rental was. Uh, we looked at a place that was, you know, in ter- from a business perspective, great, uh, you know, egress and all the things, all the check marks you're looking for and uh, big square footage and a big per square footage dollar they wanted. But we thought, well, you know, you gotta, they got to see you. You know, that's half the advertising right there is visibility. And so we were this close to signing there. And I know now that had we signed there, we would have been closed in six months. It just would, the overhead would have been way too high. So we went from a place that was looking for, I want to say $16 a square foot plus, uh, or what they call plus plus utilities, taxes, maintenance, you, you know, all of that stuff that they tack onto it. And we went out to a place that was like 10 bucks a square foot. And, you know, that, that was good because it kept our, our expenses as low as we could so that we could maximize whatever revenue it may or may not bring into us. So uh, that was, that was again, um, just a practical matter. You know, you don't need to be on the main street. You know, the walk-in traffic for our type of business isn't massive. And even if, if it was, it would be an inconvenience because I would have to take time away from clients I'm training to do a pitch. And I wasn't interested in that. So we were maybe better part of a mile and a bit outside of the main drag. Mm-hmm. And, and um, that that was okay. Word traveled and, and it wasn't a big inconvenience for people to drive to where we are. Did, why did word travel though? I think that's what I'm curious about. Was it because you've lived in this town your whole life, small town, people know who you are, you already have a big network you could talk about it with? No, no. I, In fact, while I'd always had an interest in weight training and exercise, I moved to this town in 1979, finished high school, and that's when some people got to know me and what my interests were. And then... I didn't really see these people. You know, I, I worked a little bit. I went to university, came back. And then we went, my wife and I went to the States for nine years. We lived there. And it was upon our return that I started thinking about opening a fitness center. So I didn't have a, a cloister of, uh, uh, you know, acolytes that uh, would support me in this or that knew of me or what my interests were. Um, so it was almost like starting from scratch with zero profile. But again, when people would come in and speak to me, you know, for some reason, they'd come away thinking I knew what I was talking about. And, and it was, it, again, it was evidence-based. It wasn't like, you know, I was uh, the Wizard of Oz hiding behind a curtain, you know, creating, uh, uh, you know, or spouting off on things that I, which may or may not be true. Um, I was, uh, at that, particularly at that point, I, I was nose deep in research. So, you know, I always had it at the tip of my fingers, any study on anything from one set to, to once a week to the cardiovascular yeah. benefits. I, I, underst- I understand that. I just what I'm trying to get at is for us, for example, my business partner and his wife have lived here their whole life, right? Yeah. So it was so easy to get tons of customers like because, yeah, of, their, because of their network, right? Um, and it's it's... Well, it's not actually overly complicated, but the, uh, currently our business is kind of split um, because we're actually we're actually uh, opening a second business, second high intensity training business that's focused on a different kind of protocol um, than the one I run, um, and that's a, another conversation. But 
I've been focusing on getting clients for our particular model, which is 30 minutes once or twice a week, a little bit more volume. And we, I, because I don't have any network in Galway, right? So in terms of, I don't have that to leverage. And so for me, it's all about been, it's all about networking. BNI has been huge. Uh, Business Networking International, if you're familiar with that, John. No, um, okay. It's just, a, it's just a, you know, a weekly networking group where it's all based on givers gain. So you help find business for people in the group and then you get business in return. And it works really well, especially for our space. So mm-hmm. I've used that. And so that's an example of someone who like, you know, got parachuted into an area and had to kind of grow the business from nothing. And then, you know, my business partner who's, who has that network. Right. Um, and like you say, it's such a, if you, if it's such a unique proposition or it's likely to be a unique proposition in your area that it's just a much easier sell, uh, than, than a lot of things, um, out there. But what I'm trying to understand view is like, <coughs> like you say, you didn't have the network, right? You weren't living there for ages. You weren't in a good location. No. You were an expert and people perceived you as an expert, but how did they find you? Like, how did that start happening? I mean, maybe it's hard for you to remember. Uh, yeah, well, 17 years ago. Um, <laughs> I, I think <clears throat> it, it was bit by bit. You know, I do a talk at, a, at the Rotary Group. And then they talk amongst themselves. And then two or three of them would come over and want to try it out or join. Um, I think the, the initial newspaper ads got our, got the word out. Um, back 17 years ago, I mean, the internet wasn't then what it is now. So, you know, and I, I was not savvy on a lot of internet stuff even then, uh, said I confessing to an IT expert here. Um, but, uh, and then we did uh, a radio campaign. So people in and around the area knew that there was this business Um, and some came in and and, uh, I mean, we have some members that joined as soon as we open and are still with us, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Um, But uh, yeah, I mean, as far as offering a template, I haven't got it. I just see your pants. You know, that's really how I opened the gym and still continue to run the gym. And, but you know, there's a certain um, authenticity with that, with people, which you know, in my community, it resonates. You know, I'm not putting on airs. I'm not uh, claiming to be uh, omniscient on anything. Um, you know, I'm just a guy running a fitness center, you know, and, and that's, that's it. But I'm a guy who's running a fitness center who happens to have a handle on certain facts that pertain to the enterprise I'm engaged in. And that's good because they know they can ask me questions. And if I don't have an immediate response or, or an answer, I can get it and I will get it for them. So they like that. I mean, and there's all, there was a, it was flattering at first, but it's burdensome now that a lot of clients assume because you have a, a good grounding and exercise physiology as it pertains to muscular training, that you're a medical person. So they come in with a shopping list of ailments. What problem? Oh, I got this problem. What do you think? And it's like, hey, you know, initially you'd give it serious thought, you know, and then I recognize, hey, you're not a physician. You don't deal in pathology. Um, Don't try and take on something that, uh, you know, I mean, I'd spend hours, you know, looking into this and come up with an informed opinion. And I thought, who, who am I to be, to be saying this kind of nonsense to people? It wasn't nonsense. It was legit, but it was, you know, they're far far better advice to seek out a professional in that discipline. And uh, so nowadays I, I, I seldom entertain the question. Someone comes in and, Oh, I got this. I got that. And it's like, well, you ought to speak to someone. You know, but it ain't do you me. have, do you have, no, I, I really like that. I love that. Deferring to the experts. You know, we don't, we're not, you know, we don't know everything. Well, um, there's, there's a bit of, I mean, there's, there's an ego thing involved that I gradually became aware of in, in um, being a personal trainer that people have to listen to. It's the old sensei syndrome, right? In martial arts, that some, some person who, uh, you know, may have been ignored as a teenager, wasn't very popular. People laughed him off when he said something. Well, now you got to listen to me because I'm the guy, I'm the personal trainer. And they revel in this. And I mean, I was never that way, but I could see it creeping into to people, you know, that, that they're getting attention and getting uh, you know, undivided attention from the client 
And, and you can tell them to do anything, you know, spin three times, jump up and down, and they'll do it because they think it's good for them, you know. And, and uh, uh, it's a problem with personal trainers, and I, I, I see it quite a bit. And we so consequently, such personalities attempt to take on more than they really should in order to buttress the sense of, uh, you know, intellect or knowledge that they have. And really, when you, when you sift out all the silt, our knowledge is, you know, how to bend an arm, you know, <laughs> you do this and they really load the muscle. Hey, that's great. You know, but <laughs> it's nothing to have a parade over, you know, but uh, uh, I, I laugh because they always, there's so many people out with uh, uh, degrees. They like letters after their name. So I was joking that I was an, an MCT, you know, a muscular contraction therapist, you know, so I, and that's about where it ends you know <laughs> i love it john um all right so just going back to what you said about the growth so we talked about how you kind of got your first few customers and that was actually really helpful and uh, really good to understand that in a bit more detail uh, and then you talked about word of mouth how it started growing from there in terms of referrals um yeah. is that is that basically how it grew from there mm. it's just re- referral only yeah, no we don't advertise marketing? at all yeah we don't advertise at all it's all word of mouth and, and especially now post-covid i want to know about the background of the client um you know one thing about running a personal training center is that you get to know these people as friends you know who their family is you know who their kids are uh, who's traveling who's not traveling what kind of uh, what kind of job they are what kind of social interaction they have and as a result of covid this is important data uh, because uh, some of my clients are seniors you know so their immune systems are somewhat compromised anyway so i, I it's funny you know i had a lady that, that uh, contacted me on Facebook, got a Facebook message. Oh, I'm in Bracebridge. You know, I want to check out your gym. And I ignored it because you know, I, I just wasn't interested. And, uh, and then I got uh, a message on my phone. Hi, you know, I'm this person and I want to check out your gym. I was like, yeah, wasn't interested. And then I got an email from this person saying that she had contacted Doug McGuff to get my email address. And had sent me this email. I thought, well, okay, you know, she's gone to a lot of trouble. I'm not going to make Doug look bad. <laughs> yeah. So I, I responded to her and basically just say, hey, you know, I got your message. Sorry for the delay. Uh, you know, how can I help you? And oh, I'd like to join you. Know, I'm a 60 year old woman and uh, in town. I want to strength train. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, but then she asked, what is your policy? on vaccinations i said well you know by law in in this province you have to be double vaccinated to come to a gym that's our policy you know because i want to keep the doors open and she said oh well that's unfortunate you know maybe if the government loosens its strictures on that then i can come and i thought yeah i mean why would i want to risk the well-being of my clients with a, a someone i know nothing about i don't know her background i don't know who she who should travel. She may not have COVID, which is great, but uh, I don't know that. And she doesn't know that. So it's, it's COVID has really um, been a game changer in a lot of respects. Uh, I, I do not aggressively look for clients. And as I indicated, I often don't <laughs> respond to inquiries. Why? I don't, I'm confused by I just, that. Yeah, I, I, it, I, it's it's a valid question that you've asked. I just, to me, it's just a pain in the ass. I, I, I'm not looking for new people. Leave me alone. You know, <laughs> not a good business model. This is a very high um, quality problem to have, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, and it's not. It's not like we have a thousand members. We don't. But to me, it's every, I, have to, I weigh up every client I get, I have to do a seminar with to explain everything. Sure. I have to explain why they're not using every machine in the gym. I have to explain, you know, how, uh, you know, evolutionary biology, uh, you know, and, and adaptation and all of this. And it's like, given the talk a thousand times, unless I really have to do it, I don't want to do it again. You know, I, I'm, I'm in there to, to do my job and to train myself. And um, if someone is skeptical or thinks this or that, go be skeptical somewhere else. I really don't have time for it. And, I, I, and uh, Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Like I say, it's, I'm not, we're not a business on the make. You know, I'm not looking to, to, to 
be the most successful gym in town in terms of numbers of people coming through the turnstile. I don't want that. Uh, I, you know, for me, I, I find the more people you get, the more problems you get because people naturally bring problems with them. And I like the group we have, you know, I get along with them. We laugh. Uh, we don't take anything very seriously. Uh, and it's a good dynamic. Um, and you get, um, people in like, I, you just, maybe it's just because I've been doing it for 17 years. Maybe it's because I'm now 60 years of age. Um, I just, there's a lot of stuff I don't have time for anymore. And you recognize maybe because of age, you can be forgiven for blowing people off occasionally, you know? Um, and that's, that's kind of what I do. Yeah, I mean, don't no, this do is, this at home, kids. If no, you're starting your own gym, no, this is this is so <coughs> this is such a different perspective on things. And you know, I'm going to ask you a few questions, John. That might be a little bit um, sensitive. So if I accept Mark, just let me know. And we'll move. I do on. break into tears easily. <laughs> I know you do. That's why I thought yeah. I'd caveat. Yeah. You know, thanks. thanks. <laughs> so, so how often how often do you get inquiries these days? Um, well, I get them weekly. Wow. Uh, yeah. uh, different sources. Usually, sure. like I have a Nautilus North Facebook page, which I normally use just to throw up uh, research. If something comes out that's kind of cool, it's like I'll throw it up there. What makes but, me laugh uh, is your website link doesn't even work on the Facebook page. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, that's my fault. My son did a really nice <laughs> web website for me. He's good at like graphic design and all that stuff. And uh, it was great until you know, basically ran out, like uh, I didn't renew the thing and there it is. So it's, you know, again, for me, I find that um, any social platform is a time suck for me. It's because you're going to get a question and you answer the question, then five more come up and you answer. And then you're, you got two jobs now. One is doing online correspondence and the other is training people. And if you're also writing, then you got a third job. So I remember years ago when, when Max Contraction Training came out, I thought I needed a designated website for the concept. And uh, I thought it was important that uh, I have a Q&A thing that where you can interact and answer questions. That's all I did. I mean, I would get 100 queries a day on the protocol. Where can I get this? How can I do this? What if I only have this type of equipment? And uh, yeah. And then you recognize, too, that for some people, it's flavor of the month. Oh, this is cool. I'm going to try this for a while and then, you know, meander on to like a rudderless ship to whatever the next port is and exercise. <laughs> and you kind of recognize eventually that it it's not worth the candle, you know. And so same thing. I let that one collapse. And I'm fine with that because I view any any protocol I've developed, I view it as a, a hitching post en route in my journey. It's not someplace I'm staying at. It's how things look to me at that time based on my knowledge, my experience. And now I've developed, you know, I've had more experience and that viewpoint now looks a little uh, in need of something, you know, and so it's been modified and adjusted and so on. Um, and that, you know, such is life, I guess. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, just going back, going back to the business. I'm just curious again, talking about the. You're all sense, about the business. Lord. I'm all about. I'm all about business. John. Let's get back to business now. You know me. I, I love. I love all the the uh, philosophical stuff too. And for, from my perspective, you seem very much like an essentialist. Like you love your writing. That seems to be where you get most of your fulfillment from, and that's where you pour yourself into that, and you eliminate or reduce everything else. It's from an outside perspective. Is that mm. fairly accurate? Could be. It, it depends. I mean, my my passions um, can ebb and flow, you know, in different areas. I, I mean, for a long time, researching exercise, there was if you didn't want to talk to me about exercise, we had nothing to talk about, you know. And I was fascinated with that. Uh, you know, Mike Manser, um, of course, was a huge influence on me, and and um, uh, you know his abstract thoughts on uh which i guess would be essentialism uh, to use your phraseology um fascinated me because it gets you thinking is there a better way to do this you know and and uh and so that uh, when i got the bod pod and 
I had a facility to actually do experimentation and testing. Loved it. Couldn't keep me out of my gym at that point. And it was cool because it was it was an authentic joy that I shared with my clients at that point about what we had discovered. Um, so I really, really uh, enjoyed that. But yes, with writing, uh, it's different because you can you can go down a rabbit hole that you're that fascinates you at the time, and there's nothing better than that. You know, you just you immerse yourself in something you really are passionate about. But I mean, if you look at my writing history, it's varied. It's not one topic, you know, and that's because different topics interest me. Unfortunately, for the most part, what, what interests me is obscure. Uh, I don't know why. It's just the way I'm wired. I think that uh, I, I really think certain things are fascinating that most people <laughs> couldn't care less about, you know, and uh but maybe that's part of the attraction is that it's not part of the herd mentality. It's something that's a little different. Um, but yeah, no, I, do they, I, do they, I'm just curious. Did you find that that helps them sell though? Because you are creating often creating a new category or being so niche, right? That it's funny, you know, same thing. I never look ahead. The sales thing never really enters my mind when I'm doing it. Never. I, no, I, of, I made, course, of course not. I, but I mean, retrospectively, I made a mistake once in my writing career of writing for the money. Uh, I forget when it was. Well, no, I do know what it was. It was back in the late 90s. I was living in the United States, and I was working for the Bruce Lee estate. And I was there on a work visa, which meant I could do Bruce Lee-related stuff full stop. Couldn't do anything else. And uh, there would come an, uh, a pause in the Bruce Lee stuff that was being done. But that was my livelihood. If I didn't write a book, I didn't get paid. If I didn't get paid, I couldn't support my family. So then it was like, shoot, I got to do something, you know, something on the side until the Bruce Lee engine kicks up again. And maybe I could see what, what the, and the other, the true reality was too, some the Bruce Lee books were, there was only a finite amount of material. So, you know, that it was, it had to come to an end at some point. But anyway, uh, I approached, a friend of mine, Curtis Wong, who published um, Inside Kung Fu Magazine. Great guy, very successful entrepreneur. And um, I just said, hey, you know, you're, you're sitting on a languishing asset here. You've got all these articles that you own the rights to, all these photos that you own the rights to. What if we did a series of books on, you know, Inside Kung Fu, the best of Taekwondo, for example, and you pull the best articles and the best photos, and there's a book. And he said, "Hey, man, if you think you can make hay with that, help yourself." So uh, he and I partnered up, and I had a publisher that was interested in it. And I was like, "Wow!" And during our conversations, Curtis said, "You know what's surprising?" He said, "Way more popular than the martial arts publications is paintball. You know, for some reason, it's it's a huge industry." And so immediately, I made the quick leap that, well, why don't we do a book on paper? You know, same sort of thing. You've got all these articles and all these photos. He said, same thing. Go ahead. See what you want to do. So uh, told the publisher and, you know, sold them on all the bells and whistles, you know, very popular, big industry, growing industry, uh, number one publication in the industry, you know, the cream of the cream. And they said, fine, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take the book. So great. So, you know, they cut a check. There it was. And then, it came down to me having to do the book and I couldn't interest myself in it. It was painful, so right? Yeah. It was so painful. <laughs> like, and, and it was a simple job. It was an edit job. You look at an article. Oh, that's good. That could be chapter one. Oh, there's another one. That's chapter two. Uh, oh, we should do something on equipment selection. Oh, there's an article and you put that in. I couldn't bring myself to do it. So I actually had to pay someone to do it. And that was a lesson to me. Never do it just for the money because it's mind numbing. And I just, again, it was like, I've never looked at the book since it's come out. I have no interest in it. Uh, and it was like being forced to go to a class that you detest in school and sit there for four months. I, it, it, that was a lesson to me. Never do it. Unless you're interested in it, keep away from it. And, and it's also, if you're not interested in it, um, I remember Brandon Lee telling me that uh, about acting. He said, if people aren't passionate about acting, qua acting, 
keep the hell away from it. You know, people like the celebrity. I want to be a star. I want to be admired, all that sort of, those are the trappings that come with being a successful actor. But unless you're interested in the craft, keep the hell away from it. And that's been my rule of thumb subconsciously, I suppose, in business and in writing. If I'm not interested in a subject, I'm not going near it. Yeah. What a wonderful lesson. Really good advice. So going back to Nautilus North, John, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just curious, you know, you, um, we were speaking there about, you know, you don't want any more members. You're happy with the ones you have. Can you talk to us about the number of members you have or, or maybe a better uh, metric might be workouts per week? that kind of thing. So we can get a, a scope, a, a, an idea of the scale. It's it's varied because there was a time, I think, when we had about 500 members, which was a lot when I look back. Um, I would say we're, right now, after COVID, we're probably just over 100 members. I think our members, our membership is coming back. Uh, so it'd be on average 100 workouts a week, give or take, um, that we're doing presently. Thank you. Um, and do you, cause I know you, you talked about how you started this business. You weren't really interested in making money from it, making a profit for yourself. You were just, okay, well, how do we, how do we make this work for everyone? How do we I wanted to people... train in a Nautilus center is what I wanted. Right. We didn't have one. Right. Yeah. right. Right. And, and you thought, well, you know, we'll get a space. We'll then charge workouts and cover the cost. But fast forward to now, you have a staff right running that, and do you take money from that now? Is that is that profitable for you now? Um, and is it something that you rely on, or is is your other pursuits fine for you in that regard? If you don't mind me asking, I don't know if I understand the question. What are you asking me again? Well, do you make money from the studio? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I may be I may be a passionate person, but I'm no fool. You know, um, yeah, uh, we. Uh, I would say that's my nucleus. It's not a. I mean, it's not a ton of money, obviously, but it's enough that allows me to do other pursuits to supplement that. Um, but I could see that if someone didn't have the uh, expense that I have on a monthly basis that they could be quite comfortable uh, doing what I'm doing. Um, it's just from the gym, you know, it's uh, yeah. I, I charge what I think is that the market will bear for my product, if you will. Um, what do you charge per workout? Depends. I sell them in blocks of sessions. So it ranges anywhere from $50 for a, a one-off to uh, $40 for 12, I think, 40 per session. And then I think the next one's a, uh, we, we do a 40 session pack, which works out to $30 a session. And that's as low generally as it goes. This episode is brought to you by ARX. These are the most intense exercise machines I've ever used. I remember how fast the pull-down exercise took me to muscular failure and beyond. On the final negative or eccentric excursion, my tank was practically empty, but the adaptive resistance enabled me to continue to perform work until the predetermined end of the set. This experience was very profound and made me realize how effective ARX is in helping clients reach a high level of intensity in their workouts and ultimately produce the best results. I also love how ARX measures and tracks range of motion, rep cadence, total output and time, and more with real-time audio and visual feedback. These features are powerful sales and retention tools to help you convert and keep more clients. As a listener of the High Intensity Business Podcast, ARX is offering you $500 off your machines. Just go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB to book a call with the ARX sales team to learn how ARX can revolutionize and grow your fitness business. Again, go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB and now back to the episode. Oh, interesting. One of the things you said at the start, um, which I guess maybe you already answered this, but people really like to work with you 
as the trainer at the beginning, right? They mm-hmm. wanted you, like, it's interesting. You said, you know, we, we thought people would just come in and train by themselves. We didn't think they would necessarily yeah. need us to train them. Um, and you quickly realized, no, actually, people want to be trained. And maybe that's yeah. also part of an adherence thing. They wouldn't keep it up unless they had maybe the accountability of a trainer as well. And wh- why did they really like, what was the feedback to you in terms of why they wanted to be trained by you? Do you remember, or is that something you perhaps hear now? Uh, I, maybe I overstated that. Um what happens is, I mean, over the years, we've had different trainers that have worked for us. And, um, but, you know, clients that let's say have been coming for a year and suddenly a new trainer's face pops up, they know that they don't have the experience that those that were there before them have. So they prefer being with someone who's, who's been doing this a little longer. Um, but I have, I mean, my wife, for example, has been training clients alongside me since I opened. So they're very comfortable with Terry. She knows, I mean, she knows from a practical standpoint, all you need to know to train a client. I have another uh, person who was a client and became a trainer, God, 15 years ago. And his name is Jeremy Heimers. And he's a great trainer. If you think I'm laid back and an essentialist, you got to meet Jeremy. Um, But again, he he comes in uh, one night a week. And he helps uh, Wednesday evenings and the clients love him. Um, he's, he knows his stuff. He's a good trainer and he's, he's in good shape. Um, so, you know, he's got a check mark in every box. Plus he's got experience he's been doing it for 15 years. You know? So they, they know him as well as they know me. The ones that gravitate to me are ones who um, generally that, that have some sort of a medical condition. Um, so they, they don't want to entrust their health to, um, you know, a trainer who's just, uh, you know, come out of uh, community college, you know, and it hasn't really worked with people before they'd rather have. And, and, uh, you know, if I do a book, uh, I guess they, uh, like, uh, I'm sure it's the same as in Doug's facility, you know, I mean, who would you rather have train you, you know, Fred Buckowitz or Dr. Doug McGuff, you know, and. Uh, you know, nine, nine out of 10 are going to go with the doc, you know? And so I think if your profile is raised a little bit for one reason or another, you've written a book, you've appeared in the newspaper, what have you, um, you know, the tall tree gets the attention. So they tend to gravitate toward that. But uh, as far as, you know, the ability to count reps, uh, you know, anyone's as good as I am at that. And what's your involvement now? The business? Every day. Yeah. I usually in there. About uh, varies from six thirty to seven thirty a.m. until five to six p.m. every day. So, how do you then find time to write? Is that just in the evenings? Got to find time. Sometimes in between clients, if I'm oh. got some, but weekends big time. And uh, when I come home after work, I write. You know, and uh, it's a uh, it's an odd existence, um, very insular existence in some respects. But uh, my wife has learned to tolerate my idiosyncrasies so that's uh it's it's worked out okay i was totally wrong then because i thought um that you didn't have any involvement with the studio and that oh, you, no, and all your time what, not not any involvement i thought you had very little involvement and then all your uh, time was in the writing but no, okay. i'm hands on yeah, every day okay. every day except One monday today, where uh we now take mondays off it's, it's funny we're in a small town and I used to complain about that to my wife. It's like, why is all the businesses, why are they closed on Mondays? Like, what, what's the deal? And uh, back when we had sons playing hockey or playing sports, our weekends were always spoken for. We had to travel to tournaments or they had games or whatever. So uh, once my kids grew out of that and went on to university and doing their own thing, um, I found myself with time to spare on the weekends. So I work Saturday mornings now and then take Monday off. But uh, I don't know, it's, I'm always up for an extra day off. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> and and just with regard to the detail on the the, the training on uh, that you do at Nautilus North, is it what what is the I mean I can understand that probably every program is tailored to the client, but is there a basic overview you can give of of what the workouts look like, the protocols that are used, you know, is it is it five exercises? Is it 10 exercises? Is it typically single set to failure? Is it always once a week, et cetera? 
Um, yeah, it's, I mean, typically if, if I have a new client, I will usually use uh, DeLorme and Watkins method, three sets of 10. It's, you know, the warm ups built into it. Sets get progressively a little more difficult. So they get more comfortable with being uncomfortable. And then they have their work set, the third set. I typically will use three to four exercises. That's it. So nine to 12 sets uh, total. But then the protocol will vary. It'll, I, I think marrying the psyche to the soma is important with a client. For example, I could, let's say, super slow. Uh, you know, Doug will talk to you and say, you know, this is why this is the best protocol for you to use. And you may hate it. You may absolutely hate it. And you think, you know, I could lift more weight and you know, focusing on turnaround seems like a silly thing. And you just can't, you can't invest in it emotionally. So the thing is, you can still get a productive workout. You can still do a high intensity workout in the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. And, you know, that's something I've, I've come to recognize more so over the years training clients is that there's some that simply, they're not interested in that. So you've got to find out, well, what is your psyche like? What, how do you respond? And as long as it doesn't tip too far into momentum or, uh, you know, poor form or something that could be at risk to them in terms of their safety, I'm willing to work with them on that. I, I don't do a lot of sets. Uh, three is the max, and that's just because two of them are preparatory. Um, and then other people, I might just do uh, circuit training, 30 seconds on a, on a station. Other times, I'll have a variation of circuit training where you'll end to warm and walk where the client will start out doing 30 seconds, a very slow repetitions to warm up, 30-second rest, then another 30 seconds at a medium tempo, 30-second rest. 30 seconds at a sprint, sort of like high intensity interval training. Um, and I'll do, you know, six, seven machines on that one. Uh, other times it's just one set um, to failure. Typically when Jeremy and I train, we train together Wednesday nights. Our workouts are very brief, six minutes, maybe. Um, but the protocols are whatever we feel like doing at this point. Like recently I've been, we've been experimenting again with, uh, Mike Menser's Infotonic and uh, Rest Pause Training. Hadn't done it in, God, 12 years, but it was great. You know? and, and I think it's necessary to agitate the system a little bit um, by giving it, you know, again, the, we have options in the high intensity community, but the, we're kind of labeled falsely as being one set to failure, uh, super slow. And that's not high intensity training. That's, that's one flavor of it. That's one color in the paint box of it. There's lots of other ones that are equally as effective, particularly given that all of your gains are genetically mediated anyway. So, you know, there is, uh, I, you know, for a long time, I was obsessed with finding the perfect routine, the perfect routine, absolutely maximum stimulation, not one second over the imposition of that training stress uh, to stimulate maximum fiber adaptation uh, it was safe. Yeah, and then the right uh, uh, training frequency. Um, but then, you know, I've come to learn over time that initially I thought it was just me. I thought I just got bored with it and had to change. But it, it was my body basically having adapted to it. So, you know, busting your nuts to try and get you know, some sort of gain that is no longer forthcoming seemed to me a silly enterprise. Um, even though that's what you have to do to stimulate maximum growth, maybe, but my maximum growth topped out about 10 years ago, you know, so uh, I have no desire of driving up higher levels of wear and tear, of feeling like crap longer than I need to during the week. You know, I'm, I'm happy to go in, uh, put forth my best effort that is I'm capable of on a given day and let, let it be at that. Um, the, you know, the, the, I've, in my book, uh, Time Savers Workout, I talk about the conservation of energy phenomenon. And I see that at play in everything. And so it's not just you have a low boredom threshold. It's your body will adapt almost instantaneously to whatever the best protocol is you give. And then it's no longer the best protocol because it's not having the same effect. 
Um, but again, it, it's always within parameters. You know, it will be intense, it'll be brief, and it will be infrequent. And under that umbrella, you've got lots of latitude. Let me ask you about that because I want to jump on to uh, talking about your uh, six minute hit uni course, which looks really interesting. And obviously, I want to talk about that and promote that to the listeners. And in there, you talk about the conservation of energy phenomenon. I think we have also talked about it on the podcast, but you know, sometimes we duplicate ourselves in this podcast, John, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> That's right. I, I think honestly, some things get said in this podcast like a hundred times, but they need to be said a hundred times. Um, and with with regard to CEP, I was just curious, you know, how you program that in. I just give you an example for us. What we do is we do an A B routine of everyone, and then we do eight um, eight sessions of the A routine, eight sessions of the B, and then we will change the workout. Right, and and there will be some variety in the workout in terms of there'll be different cadences, there are di- different protocols. Whether it's you know single step to failure with with or without advanced techniques like rest pauses, negatives, isometrics, etc. Yeah. Um, and then after sixteen sessions, we we would then change the workouts completely uh, in alignment with any changing needs or goals that, or motivations the client has. Right, so that's kind of our way of taking advantage of that, but. I just wonder whether that's less than optimal. How do you think about that as it relates to the, the programming? I know it's uh, that's a very It's nuanced. as good as any I've come across. Um, oh, yeah, yeah I, I, it's one of these things that we're dealing with an organic process. So it's not linear. It's not mathematical. Um, and so for some clients, eight weeks may be too long. For others, it might not be long enough um, you know, to milk out the maximum benefit they can get from that particular protocol. And that's why I think that the trainer has to be attuned to the client yeah. um, and attuned, attuned to the client in a couple of ways. One is, are they responding? Are you tapping the higher order fibers uh, like fast twitch fibers? And you know that because they produce a mother load of lactic acid, which gets back engineered into pyruvate. Shout out to Doug McGuff for that one. Um, and then that stimulates your cardiovascular system. So if the client's not huffing and puffing, they haven't really, drilled deep enough. And the first time they do a new protocol, you notice that their respiration is, is right up. It's high uh, because the body is all in at that point. Some new stress, they, they over-mobilize the muscular fibers that are involved in the activity. And then the more you repeat that activity or the client repeats that activity, they withdraw until just the fibers required to do the activity are left, which has a less than profound metabolic effect. But it changes. And the other factor is the psyche, as we touched on. If someone's not motivated to go hard, it doesn't matter what the protocol is. They're not not going to get any benefit out of it. So uh, I remember speaking with Bill Simone about this. Um, I forget the context, but we were talking about it. And he mentioned, he said, I think the psyche is really important. And I said, I agree. And he seemed surprised that I would say that or agree with him. Because I think he expected some sort of militant, high intensity, super fundamentalist hit back. response. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I'm not. You know, um, no, no, not at all. It was it was one of the reasons actually. Doug and I used to have a website uh, when Body by Science first came up, and to me, I like I like to to explore and see new avenues and what we can do. And with that in mind, I would post certain things that we did. I was even posting videos at the time of the uh, done in one. Max Pyramid, some of these protocols that had really um, elicited um, interesting metabolic responses from clients. And almost immediately, I'd get shouted down by the super slow uh, zealots that were uh, fans of Body by Science to the point where I just thought, you know what, screw it. You know, I took down the videos and stopped contributing because it was clear that they'd already... You know, they figured they'd reached the end of the line as far as all potential knowledge on exercise was, and it stopped there. And you know, anything else was heresy. So uh, that yeah, wasn't it's, the kind of people what, I wanted to speak to. That's one of the things, right? It, you know, um, one of your, I suppose, if you don't want me saying, one of yours and Doug's undesired byproducts of Body by Science was some people became so dogmatic about I think it, just or, or they misinterpret it. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say, I, I believe that attitude existed before the book. No, of, of course yeah. it did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. But um, it just gave them a rally. Right. 
yeah 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 it gave them maybe i was gonna say like created an ideology but it, yeah it rallying points probably a better way of putting it um, well, yeah, we because we put all the data in the book uh, the, the premise of the book really was uh, at least as i spoke to doug about it before we wrote it was let's enter this as two guys that know nothing about exercise let's check all our experience and what we think we know at the door and look at the evidence to see what is suggestive you know why you know and, and slowly weight training came to the fore as being efficient and uh effective and then it was how often do you need to do it then there was the genetic factor which also weighed in on how often you need to do it um and then it was the intensity factor and all these things and we went through all the data and um i'd say a bit of our prejudices probably crept in a little bit on the protocols uh Doug came out of the Ken Hutchins super slow school. He's certified in that. And so, you know, he, he knew what he was doing and he knew why he was doing. It. And so that got advocated. Um, we, we did advocate for variation. And I think we likened it to various spokes coming off the hub of a wheel. You know, you travel down one spoke, then you come back to your, your, your big five or your big three routine. Um, but you could deviate from that. And so one of the deviations was um, max contraction, uh, which was you know, my uh, contribution, if you will, to uh, isometric training. But it was just, I mean, it's one spoke in a multi-spoke wheel. You know? I mean, so, but we, we did have a, you know, the, once the book came out, a lot of people that were already super slow guys yeah. gravitated to it as the Bible. This is it. See, we were right. And here's the evidence here. Because to my knowledge, Ken Hutchins never put data or, or, or um, studies in his books. Um, he, he had, like Arthur Jones, he, he was big on uh, a logical presentation, but, but corroborating evidence, not so much. Um, but now it had all been brought together. You know, it was the evidence, the footnotes, the studies, the protocol. And so that became the, you know, the torch that they, they carried. And, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, that that type of mentality doesn't interest me, um, because and because a lot of it um, doesn't require any thinking. You just accept it, you know. It's it's like religious dogma, and um, that those type of people are not the type of people you want to have coffee with. You know, um, I, I remember in the Bruce Lee world, for example, I going through one of the things I did was I went through his personal library. He had like 2000 books and, you know, I built these shelves and got an Ikea bookshelf or something. We had an office space that we rented for his archive in Idaho. And I put all his books on the shelf, according to martial arts, boxing, dance, art, psychology, philosophy, self-help, motivation, etc. But what was really cool was I could pull a book off the shelf and flip it open. And there would be marginalia that he had written. And I mean, he was the last one to see it, you know, so it was like, wow, you know, this is pretty cool. And then you could see what that tied into. Like there was a something that he had written that had been published and you could say, ah, this is the genesis of it. Very cool. This is how it, it percolated and it grew and it led to that. And um, would he be having a, would he be having, cause I heard Ryan holiday talk about this very recently, actually the way he studies books. And I'm curious, would Bruce Lee be having a dialogue with the author, challenging the concepts of the book, going along, going back to what you're saying about thinking for yourself? I didn't. He was doing. You know what? I didn't. I didn't see a lot of evidence of that okay. because he mainly bought books that he had an interest in. So there was a certain tacit agreement with the premise being put forth by the author. But he would either pull out and synopsize the important points, or elaborate on a point on how it might relate to unarmed combat. But uh, so anyway, when I was immersed in that, that for like eight hours a day for four years or something um, and his papers. And, and so it, as far as his philosophy went, it wasn't an abstract thing to me. I knew and could reference it, but then you would present something that was, hadn't been seen before on Bruce on his philosophy. And like, for example, some piece of marginalia, and someone would respond with, be water, my friend. I was like, what's that have to do with this? You know, nothing. 
but it's, they're just parroting it. You know, it's, they don't understand it. They don't read it. They don't, they haven't traced the evolution of how it came to that. And in that particular instance, Bruce Lee never said that, you know, it was written by Sterling Silicon, who was a screenwriter for the television series Longstreet. You know, Bruce Lee believed in water as being a metaphor for adaptability in combat. But that whole diatribe of, you know, you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup you put in a teapot, it becomes the teapot, et cetera, et cetera. He didn't write that. You know, it's a Sterling Silifant wrote that. So people are, oh, be water, my friend, Bruce Lee. Well, you know, kind of, you know, but it's almost like saying, why did they build them so high? Sterling, you know, Bruce Lee, because he also wrote Towering Inferno, you know, and it has about as much uh, nexus as uh, with Bruce as that did. But that aside, then the only reason I mention it is that I see the same thing in exercise. People just blindly accept something, will throw out a quote uh, without understanding the context fully, or even thinking about it, you know, just to let you know that they, you know, they support the cause, a little you know, coded phrase there, you know. Um, but I, I think it not only does it do that person a disservice to not research it more thoroughly. It does their clients a disservice because they don't understand the concepts they're preaching. Um, and it, it, I'm so guilty of that parroting well, something that you or Doug said in that book about fully understanding it. And then maybe five years later, having a much better understanding of it and going, yeah. aha, and then thinking, God, how much of an idiot was I just parroting that I should just keep my mouth shut. <laughs> what was the, what was that old adage that uh, it's better to keep your mouth shut and let people think you're an idiot than open your mouth and remove all doubt? Yeah, you know, yeah, so, very well said. Yeah, and that's uh, <laughs> no, I mean we've all done that, and uh, but again, course, yeah. that's the CEP I think uh, coming into play. It doesn't just work for our muscles. Our brain is fueled by glial cells which store um, glycogen, so there's energy going uh, cerebrally as well. And if we don't have to expend energy thinking and fretting and reasoning, it's much easier just to take this. And I mean, we're all guilty of it. You'll probably do the same thing. You, you tell me what it means. You know, how many times have I said that to someone? Oh, did you see the movie? What was it like? Because you know, I don't want to you know, go into the car and drive down to the theater and sit through it through an hour and a half. Uh, you know, the book. Oh, how was the book? Was it good? Yeah, what's it about? You know, and, and we do that reflexively. And it's all energy saving patterns, either cerebrally or in the case of exercise, physically, you know. And uh, I, I remember in business, perfect example. Um, often was the time you'd, you'd have a product, and you want to sell the product, but you know, I don't want to really think about how to sell the product. You know, we should get someone to do that, and I can focus on the creative end of things, which is really just a way of saying I don't want to do the work. So we'll farm it off onto someone else, you know, and. Uh, yeah, we'll let someone else do it. I'll handle the creative stuff. I'm like, yeah, okay, pal, right? But we all do that. And I think it's important that we not fob it off onto somebody else, but actually get involved and understand what it is you're doing and why, because you're going to make mistakes. That's, that's part of the process. But the way you don't make future mistakes is to learn of them firsthand when you're doing them, not you know by secondhand thing oh that didn't work out so much it does that doesn't have the same resonance as experiencing it firsthand and making the necessary adjustments and then it's ingrained so you don't make those mistakes again yeah completely agree so let's talk about your course we've talked about conservation of energy don't you want to talk about is part business? of business don't you want to talk about my business do you know what john you <laughs> definitely are the man who has the most interesting tangents of any man I ever spoke to on this podcast. And I'm not over exaggerating that. I don't like, get out much. You know. I, no, I love it. I actually love your tangents and uh, I feel bad for trying to bring us back on track, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm just conscious of time and I want to make sure that I deliver on, on the sort of some sort of rough agenda that I laid out here for us. And um, so you've got this, this hit uni course, the six minute, um, six minute workout. And there's like six components that make it up. You've got, you know, minimal exercise, high intensity, uh, minimizing wear and tear once a week training, how to realize your genetic potential CEP, which we already covered. And obviously based on 30 years of research. Um, I just wondered if you had any, any words you wanted to you know share to, to just describe the course to people been a bit more detail beyond what I just said, um, no, think really? a, a taste of it. <laughs> I don't no, know you're going to no, say that. Really. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, 
it, it's a course that uh, Simon more or less hounded me to do. I didn't want to do it. And I said, you know, why? You know, like there's got to be, like you said with the uh, business, you know, there's other people that are better at it. And I was the same way. And he said, no, I think you should do it. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my wife and I had gone away. I think we went to Cuba for a week or something. Our kids got us that for a Christmas present. And Simon, in the meantime, had said, well, I'm going to come to Canada. You know, I'm going to be there and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And initially, we were just going to do an interview. Right, because he he huh. does interviews on his thing, yeah. And you know, Simon being Simon, um, I love then, this about Simon. Go on. Yeah, he said, "Well, you know, I'm, we're here now. I got the camera, and we can do it." And I said, "Well, you know, I'm envisioning training somebody in a studio setting and uh, doing a presentation with graphics and all that." He said, "No, no, no, just talk." So he'd fire a question, and I mean, I'm standing in the hallway of this warehouse that we have our gym in and you got this harsh overhead lighting and it was from a visual perspective it's uh, you know you don't want to eat anything before you watch it. um but he uh took this raw material which i thought was probably useless and turned it into a proper course i don't know how he did it um he's he's very good at what he does and so that's how it came to be but it's um it's it, essentially it's just my view on on exercise, the industry, what's important to focus on, what is not, and a means of diminished expectations because you know exercise is an industry full of smoke and mirrors and magic beans and pixie dust and you know it's it's it never delivers on those promises, but by the time you figure out and lose interest that it it's largely fraudulent you've been replaced by a new group of people that have just come into the industry. So my thought is here are the detour signs and the roadblocks um, to let you know, going into the enterprise uh, right off the bat. So that in essence is the, the premise of the uh, six minute workout. Thank you for that. No, I, I love your response to that and fair play to Simon for being tenacious and very very creative and yeah he's good at that he's good at taking obviously something like that i couldn't believe it i I couldn't believe it when i saw the finished product i was like how did you make that out of this you know but he he did so props to him fair play and yeah i think there's some things that really stood out for me i'm just looking at the course now on the website um you know you've got a 12 month blueprint of structured routines for uh, for people to follow, detailing exactly what to do and when, um, how to ensure results and continued progress. Uh, over the course of the year, you will integrate all the key protocols presented in the course. I thought that was really cool. I think for the price point, one hundred twenty nine dollars, um, that alone is is pretty awesome. And obviously, there's a whole bunch more to it, which you've touched on: fitness industry, how it exploits insecurity and hope. Um, why resistance training is great for not only for strength, but also cardio, conservation of energy phenomenon, which we touched on already, and a bunch of other stuff. So I think to the listeners who I know are massive fans of you, John, if they want to get into inside your head and understand how you're thinking about exercise and your advice to people, I think this is the place to go. And it's it's helpful to people to have, I think, a course which encapsulates everything. I know obviously there's yeah, I'm sure you have more knowledge and expertise beyond the course as well, but it's a nice way of just packaging it all together so people can consume it and act on it. So I appreciate you doing it as well. Oh, well, thank you. No, it's it's one of those things that, again, uh, a lot of people have questions, and you get that too, I'm sure. Um, and a lot of people think they need to come to my gym in order to do what we do. Um, but the reality is you just need to know what to do and why you're doing it. And uh, you can save yourself in some instances a gym membership, you know, which, uh, and I'm not, I'm not denigrating gym memberships. I think they're helpful and they're useful, but for some people where it's not practical, they don't have to beat themselves up over, you know, the the information is there if you're interested in, you know, and, um, and make the application to your own life. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, for those who are listening to this or watching this and interested in learning more about the course, uh, please go to hituni.com and it's called John Little's Six Minute 
workout, I want to say. Is that what it's called? John Little's High Intensity Resistance Training, six minute hit, even. Um, and if you use the coupon code HIB10, you will get 10% off as well. Um, and if you go to a blog post for this episode 343, you'll also uh, get links to it as well. Um, and just so you're aware, I mean, John's one of my favorite guests ever, and I've done some amazing podcasts with him in the past. And if you're interested in listening to John and I talk about more nonsense, it's not nonsense, <laughs> it's actually really, really good stuff. Um, check out episode 18, which is one of the ones in the very beginning. That was years ago, John. Uh, inside the mind that. of... Go ahead. Oh, when was that? Was oh, man. Uh, do you know what? Let me check, actually. I'm just going to... I'm not... Yeah. I just remember that was a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. So this one's called, um, it's called John Little Inside the Mind of Mike Mensa, Body by Science and His Workout with Hercules. <laughs> I'm, I'm just yeah. going to, I'm going to bring it up because I think I've got the dates that come up. Yeah, here we go. So, oh, hang on a second. I've got to search your name for it to come up on the website. Just bear with me a few seconds here, listeners. And while you're doing while that, I, I will point out to the viewer that I'm wearing a Guinness sweatshirt and you are not, and you live in Ireland. I know, I know. And I disgraceful. Live in so it's yeah. blasphemous on your part. Do you know, I, I do actually have, are you a Jordan Peterson fan at all, John? My son is. I I, I like Jordan Peterson, but my, my knee-jerk reaction to him is that he's a watered-down Joseph Campbell who did Mythos, you know, and... Uh, I find, I don't know, it's just me, but I find his voice annoying. Uh, so. Fair enough. I have, well, I have a, I have his t-shirt on underneath this, which is a big lobster sure on the do. front of it. Sure uh, you do. I know, I'm that guy. <laughs> As a gift from the missus, so, you know. But um, I, fi I figured, you know, he's Canadian, so if I should have uh, perhaps taken no, a he's, he's good, yeah. and people whose intelligence I respect quite like him. Um, I have a friend of mine who I've known since kindergarten whose IQ is off the charts. And uh, he followed Jordan Peterson before the Jordan Peterson explosion occurred uh, because he used to post some of his uh, university lectures online and he quite liked it. And now that he's famous, of course, he has no interest in it, but um, he's, <laughs> he's good. But it's, you know, to me, it's um, like I'm always been interested in philosophy for a long time. And so thinkers from, Plato through to Nietzsche uh, and beyond. So I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing anything really profound in what Jordan Peterson says um, as against some other people that have said some very profound things, get you thinking in different areas. Um, he's good. I just find that I can't, uh, there's nothing for me to hook onto. If I, if I try to watch a video and I've tried, uh, I just find he kind of goes, he meanders quite a bit. Um, and with that meandering goes my interest, you know? So, uh, my son has his first two books and, and loves them, you know, which oh, is great. Man. I mean, anything that stimulates your intellect is, is terrific. And he certainly does that. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, uh, listeners will know I'm just a huge fan and, uh, yeah, I've read all his stuff and I constantly watch his videos. I, I think he's great, but no, I respect your opinion. And, um, well, it doesn't mean my opinion is correct. You know, no, I know, I know, I know. Um, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't watched him enough or read him enough to even form an opinion of him. Mm -hmm. um, I just heard certain things where he was talking about um, myth and how it's metaphor for certain things. And I thought, well, that's Joseph Campbell. Now, it doesn't mean Jordan Peterson can't express the same opinion and maybe put his own interpretation on it. Sure, I just yeah. didn't stay on the ride long enough to get it. You know, so that's, that's on me, not on Jordan Peterson. Yeah, interesting. So anyway, I found the date. So episode 18 was June 21st, 2015. We recorded that together. Wow. Six years yeah, ago. Six that's years. Crazy. And uh, that's a great episode. If listeners want to restart at the beginning, right? Then you've got episode 65, How to Find Your Purpose, which one mm -hmm. of my favorite ones we did together, which is absolutely nothing to do with high intensity training or strength <laughs> training business which won't surprise you because john has lots of interests outside of this space uh, but it's still amazing and you know i i i actually want to revisit it because that was one of those podcasts that left left me thinking about some of the things we talked about for a very long time um as it relates to just thinking of different trying to reach back into my memory now but thinking of different sort of um 
uh, mental models and just philosophy for thinking about how to live the best, your best life, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and then the other two podcasts we did were 214, uh, the time savers workout part one and 221, the time wow. savers workout part two. So I'll link all this up in the show notes, but I wanted to mention that because I think it's great for people. This is our know. fifth uh, dialogue. It's our then. fifth podcast. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, and hopefully sure. many more to come. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cheers with a microphone. <laughs> I, actually, I have got a glass of water here, but it's not that exciting. So nice. uh, I would, I would have, uh, you know, appreciate a pint of Guinness, John, with well, that, who uh, toast. <laughs> uh, any parting thoughts as it relates to what we've talked about today before we, before we wrap up um officially here no you're pretty thorough i don't think uh i think you got all the water out of the hose on that one so i don't really have too much uh any any closing comments or words of wisdom to share with your viewers they're on their own <laughs> aren't we all yeah well uh, exactly and i just want to say I, I really appreciate you being so open about the business i know you don't think you're some business guru who can impart much wisdom but you'd be surprised as much of what you said which it's just useful people to get your perspective i don't know how else to put it but it just is well, and i really appreciate we, you taking time maybe be, yeah. I, we could touch on to conclude what you and i were saying before you started recording which is you don't need the business degree yeah. to and i mean and that's maybe where joseph campbell comes in again he used to say, follow your bliss and doors will open where there were no doors. And I think that'll get you a long way. Um, you, you will learn what you need to learn for your business. Uh, once you follow your passion and if exercise is your passion or high intensity training, the knowledge will come along with the experience that you need to run a business. Uh, again, Joseph Campbell had a, a really interesting tale about um, Hindu mythology or from Hindu mythology. And he called it Indra's net. And, and according to the, to the Hindu mythology across the universe has thrown this big fishing net essentially. And in the joint of every uh, portion of the net is a jewel. And if you look into that jewel, any one jewel in that net deeply enough, you will see reflected in it all of the other jewels in the universe, meaning that you can get the many out of the one. And I think if you if the one is your passion, high intensity training, and you look into that as thoroughly as you can, all the other jewels are going to you're going to learn and see. You're going to get the business acumen. You're going to learn how to deal with people. You're going to learn things such as when to change up workouts. You're going to learn more about, you're going to learn about advertising. You're going to learn about graphic design because that's part of advertising, how to get the word out. Uh, all of these things come with it. And it's funny how many times that's happened in my life. I've just blindly gone after something in terms of being interested, wanting to learn more about it. Bruce Lee was a good example. And as a result of that, I started writing about Bruce Lee. I learned about Eastern philosophy, another jewel that I hadn't thought of going in there exercise martial arts but then when i i also learned about um the book publishing business i learned about filmmaking i learned about music i composed the music for the first bruce lee film i did didn't know i did that um, um editing all that sort of stuff that i had no knowledge of came to me as a result of pursuing that one passion and looking that deeply into that one jewel. And I think that applies to everybody. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're passionate about it, go for it. Be authentic. Make sure it is your passion. As Brandon Lee told me, if you're not interested in acting, don't, don't do it. Um, but uh, you'd be amazed what th subjects that you might think you have no interest in that are boring, that you couldn't sit in a business class. They come to you as part and parcel of your passion. And suddenly you've learned it without even being aware you've learned it. So there. Uh, it usually there shouldn't feel Put like that work. Pipe and smoke it. No, that was great. Uh, it usually shouldn't feel like work, right? Is is another filter. Like if you feel this is like really, really grinding out, it's really like not enjoyable and you don't look forward to it, then you're probably focusing on the wrong thing as a, yeah, as a general it's not, rule. it's not your passion. You're on the yeah. wrong, you know, it, you're writing a paintball book. But that's, yeah, exactly. You're writing a paintball book. Great, great, great way to bring it back. Um, and on, But on the same note, do you think 
that it's important to distinguish distinguish between that and doing some of the work in that space which you don't enjoy because it just has to get done sometimes right so for example you love you enjoy high intensity training you enjoy the studio and and operating in that and and working in there Um, but let's say you don't really enjoy hoovering the carpet right and not saying you do hoover the carpet (laughs) but just to say you didn't have a cleaner or whatever um but it has to be done right so that Mm -hmm. so i think it's important to distinguish that because i don't want people i don't know maybe people are smarter than i get them credit for but i don't want people thinking well hang on i i hate hoovering the carpet so i'm in the wrong business here you, you know? oh yeah no well bad, I mean, bad I, analogy but. Yeah. well yeah i mean that would that would be applicable if somebody went into the carpet cleaning business you know but <laughs> yeah exactly it, it, it's, if you go into yeah. something else of which cleaning the carpet is necessary for the people and for the uh, high hygienics of the place uh it doesn't it's not really loving hoovering. It's just part and parcel of what you do. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, and again, you know, if you, if you want to go into the carpet cleaning business, you know, you have my blessings on that. Yeah. All right. Well, I know John, it's your passion. What's that? I say, I know that the cleaning carpets is your passion. Oh yeah. Yeah. I yeah, love me some car- carpet cleaning. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm going <laughs> to get straight to it after this. Now, you know, what? after this, actually, <laughs> after this, I'm actually going on a really cognitively challenging zoom call with my business partner where we're going to be talking about financials as it relates to as we, we grow our team and i don't know if how i'm going to do this because i am smoked Lord. after this conversation john i mean that in, as a compliment <laughs> um but but we're just going to do it anyway so there you go i'll just um, nod your head a lot and he'll, <laughs> he'll carry the conversation <laughs> um but john look i'm again always grateful best way for people to connect with you find out more about you and I promise they won't inquire about workouts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really don't have uh, a social media profile uh, saved for Facebook. That's it. You have? Your, uh, do you want to give email or not? It's up to you, obviously. No, not really. Leave no, me the hell you. alone. Yeah, sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no. <clears throat> Sometimes not great idea. I've recently yeah. um, posted uh, some videos of Mike Menser. Actually audios that I put video to of Mike Menser on YouTube, just because I wanted to have a repository of uh, his wisdom, a place I can go and uh, spend some time with Mike again, but it, they, they've become surprisingly popular. Um, and it's almost like a, a course from Mike, if you will, because I recorded a lot of it in 1981 at a seminar. So I sometimes answer questions there, but I mean, that's usually confined to Mike and what he did, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I'm on Facebook, but I don't, I don't generally have uh, or put myself out for Q and A's. Uh, not because I, I'm not interested, sure. or I don't think the the person is sincere or, or that. I just, I just find I don't have the time. It, it's yeah. it's one of these things that I'm I'm working usually ten hours a day, and then my my spare time I might be writing. So. And mostly, you know, and again, most questions as they pertain to exercise or my perspective on exercise, I've answered already elsewhere, like on your podcast, for example. I'm sure if you went through yeah. the four previous podcasts you and I have done, I've covered anything and anything I hold in my head about exercise. And if 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 they're not convinced, there's the Hit Uni course. And if they're not convinced, there's... I think I've written 16 books on exercise. So that's, it's there. Um, well, where can they find all the books? I think that's probably a good place to send people, right? Is it Amazon, your Amazon, profile yeah. on there? Any Amazon yeah. will, will have the books, yeah. So if I link yeah. to some your... Some are better than others. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love your honesty. Um, if I link to your... What you have like a, a author page, right? I can just link to that and all your books are listed, I, sus- I suspect, on Amazon, I, right? Yeah, I think, I think yeah, so. I'll do that. I'll I think so. I'm not yeah, I'll do that. I'm not sure. Leave that. Lead that of us and we'll get that all linked yeah. up. John, so grateful. Thanks for making the time today. Hey, my day pleasure. Off. It's always good speaking to you. Uh, we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And for everyone listening or watching or doing both, uh, hopefully you're doing both, uh, to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com, search for episode 343. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. This episode is brought to you by ARX. You want to be a successful strength training studio owner. The problem is you aren't able to deliver the safest, most efficient and effective workouts. 
making it harder for you to attract and retain clients, which makes you feel frustrated. I understand that it can be difficult to differentiate your business without the right tools. ARX's Breakthrough Adaptive Resistance technology uses patented motorized resistance and computer software to give you and your clients the perfect workout every single time. BioFit founder John Zarbock says that ARX is clearly the superior tool to deliver the exercise stimulus. My clients are seeing insane improvements in weeks, not months. I could not fathom running my business without ARX. So here's how you get started. Number one, go to arxfit.com forward slash HOB to get $500 off your ARX machines. Number two, book a call with the ARX sales team. And number three, learn how ARX can help you grow your strength training business. Go to arxfit.com forward slash HIB so you can stop struggling to attract and retain clients and start to grow your strength training business with confidence.